Hello, and we are here with Dr. Brian Reaney, who is the inaugural chief of clinical trials at Vanderbilt Ingram Cancer Center. He's gonna chat with us today about all of the exciting data in kidney cancer being presented at this year's symposium. Hey, Dr. Reaney, how you Hi, doing? good, how are you? Thanks, good. Gina. Uh, all right, so there's a lot going on this year. Uh, one of the things that we heard about were the longer follow-up from the Checkmate 214 mm -hmm. trial looking at um, nivolumab and ipilimumab in intermediate and poor-risk patients with advanced RCC. Right. So what are a couple of things that we learned with these longer follow-up? So one of the nice things about this data set is that it has the longest follow-up of the phase three. So this was called the 42-month follow-up, meaning there was a minimum of 42 months of follow-up. So we're, you know, we're getting out to that three, four-year range. Um, this is obviously an all-immune combination, and the strength of immunotherapy, especially dual immunotherapy, is durability of response. I think it's its calling card. And so the nice thing about this data set is we're starting to get this long-term follow-up. We're seeing patients who um, are in remission, I think, meaning they're either on or off treatment with long-term disease control. I believe the progression-free survival rate, you know, out at the 42-month mark was something like 35 or 36 percent. Oh. So it means a third of patients that you start on therapy are still going to have disease control, you know, three and a half, four years later. That's right. amazing for kidney cancer. So I think that's the real value in this data set. None of the, a lot of the other numbers didn't change hazard ratios and okay. PFS, and so that was all consistent. But I, again, I think as this data set further matures, we'll see more and more durability. Good. Yeah. Um, and now we also have the final analysis from Checkmate 025 looking at single agent Evolumab. Right. So uh, anything different that we learned with uh, these, this data set? I, not much. And, and as you know, at least in the U.S., there's not much single agent Evolumab used because it's used up front. You know? right. so, um, but um, it's nice, again, to have that long-term follow-up. I believe if I read the swimmer's plots right that there were, um, I'm trying to remember the number, I think it was 10 or 15 percent of patients who were you know, off treatment and never received further treatment and who were still alive. So again, if you think about that, you know, 15% of the original population. So again, speaking to immunotherapy that you can start people and there will be a subset who's just gonna have really long-term benefit. I think it's greater with dual immunotherapy or the IOTKI combos. Right. So it's somewhat of a historic data set, but it still, again, speaks to the value there. Great. Yeah. Um, now, we also saw a lot of a newer agent, the HIF2 alpha inhibitor, um, MK6482 in advanced clear cell uh, RCC. So can you discuss this agent and some sure. of the activity we saw with it? Sure. So this agent's had about uh, three or four different names, so it's hard to keep track. But So this was originally a Peloton compound. Peloton was acquired by Merck recently. That's how it switched names. So this is the second generation HIF inhibitor. It's an oral drug that inhibits HIF, obviously, which is a transcription factor crucial to the biology of kidney cancer. It's really one of the first examples, maybe the first example of successfully targeting a transcription factor in oncology. Um, Nobel Prize was just awarded for this. So basically, this was a trial in refractory kidney cancer, and they've produced now a series of about three trials in refractory kidney cancer. And all of them have a very consistent theme. In fact, the discussant, I think, put them all on the same slide nicely, sort of summarizing uh, the response rates in a really highly refractory three or four prior treatment uh, group was uh, in the 20 to 25 percent range, and that's been pretty consistent. The other important characteristic of this drug is that it's really well tolerated. So VEGF TKIs, which we use as monotherapy and in combo, are great drugs, but not always um, uh, well tolerated, as you know, and sort of come with their own chronic side effects. And so this drug has activity, but it, it's really well tolerated long term from the data from my own personal experience. So there's a registration trial going on now in these refractory patients that hopefully will lead to approval. I think more exciting is that it can be a component of doublets and triplets. And as we're starting to combine more and more drugs to hopefully cure more patients, we have to be mindful of toxicity, right? It's easy for us to just start combining things for patients, not so easy. So if this can be a VEGF, you know, TKI-like drug with less toxicity, that would be a major advance. Yeah, that's some great points. Yeah. Now, um, there's a couple combination studies also with nivolumab that were presented. So could you share insight on the Nevis trial as well as the phase two trial with citravatinib and nivolumab? So Nevis, so there were a couple trials, Nevis being one of them that looked at radiotherapy in combination with nivolumab. Hans Hammers presented one of radiotherapy with ipinevo, same theme. So this is stereotactic body radiation therapy or SBRT, which is over the last, I don't know, probably decade, maybe not even, became uh, useful in lung cancer, originally tested in elderly patients who couldn't get you know, a, a thoracotomy. And so it was shown to be effective, and now it's being used uh, against metastatic sites, including kidney cancer. Um, the theory is that by radiating the tumor, you get antigen release, and that'll increase the immune response when you give an immune agent and lead to more systemic anti-tumor immunity. I think the trials, and Tom Powell's did a nice discussion um, I think it's not clear from the trials that the activity seen was any more than you would have expected from the immunotherapy alone. So I'm not convinced that it's a way to increase anti-tumor immunity, 
Having said that, um, I use SPRT in my own practice. So an example would be a patient that I'm observing who then has one area grow, still asymptomatic, I'm not ready to give them systemic therapy, so I might use SBRT in an attempt to defer therapy. Uh, that might be one example. Okay. Patient who's on systemic therapy responding but has you know, one or two areas grow. So I think the field is figuring out what to do with SBRT. <laughs> I use it more and more, although I have to tell you I always struggle when I'm giving it to a patient to, to ask myself, am I really helping this patient? Am I making them live better or longer by doing this? And I'm not sure there's definitive data. Hmm. So interesting studies, I think more work needs to be done. There's I think at least one randomized study being done, um, but it's a, it's a new tool to play with. Definitely. Yeah, and then the, the other one you asked about was citrovatinib, yep. which is a multi-targeted agent with targets similar to cabozantinib, I believe, VEGF and MET and other things, uh, in combination with nivolumab, I believe, in a refractory setting. and. That showed um, activity that I would expect, right? We know IL plus TKI is active, right? There's no question about it. Again, one of the fundamental questions for the field is, are the different um, targets and properties of TKI, do they affect immunomodulation differently? So if, if having MET and Axel and, and TAM inhibition better than just having VEGF inhibition, better than having whatever, whatever, you know? I don't think there's great data. There's not great clinical data to show that. In fact, the discussant showed a slide really of all the major VEGF IO combos or TKI IO combos, and activity looked pretty similar to me, you know, within the comparisons of small, small trials. So um, it's interesting. I don't know where it's gonna go development-wise in kidney cancer. It's a pretty crowded field, um, you know, but, but we'll see. But, but interesting, I think, supportive of what we already know. Good problem to have, a lot of combinations sure, showing right. efficacy, yeah. Um, and speaking of which, we, last year we saw the approval of the Velumab and Excitinib in the frontline setting for advanced RCC, and this year we saw some more analyses from the Javelin Renal 101 trial. So can you um, discuss anything that we may have learned from these studies this year? Yeah, so Javelin's done a nice job of looking at their data in different subsets with regard to nephrectomy or not. Uh, I believe at this meeting there's a, a gene expression, some of the translational, um, and we're really you know, we have these big clinical pieces, as you mentioned, that have led to FDA approval. We're really just starting down the road of understanding the biology of response. One nice thing, so there's data from the emotion study that Dave McDermott published in Nature Medicine. Uh, Javelin has looked at that signature and other signatures, and there seems to be a pretty consistent theme that kidney cancer is, not surprisingly, driven by angiogenesis biology and inflammatory T-cell biology, you know, and, and likely some others. But I feel like we've learned more about the biology of kidney cancer in the last few years than we knew because of these large-scale gene expression studies. And I give kudos to the sponsors, to the companies who've you know, spent time and resources doing this, even if it doesn't necessarily help their own regimen, because we're not selecting therapy based on it. It's not a clinical biomarker, but I feel like it's making us smarter about the biology of kidney cancer. Good, great insight, thank you. Um, now, is there other research that you are involved in this year that you would like to highlight? So, I mean, I'm involved in a lot of things. Um, you know, we're, I, I guess just to maybe broaden that and say what's the field sort of waiting for doing. So there's, you know, two more phase threes, Cabo Nevo and Len Pembro. We're waiting for those to come in. I, my expectation is that they'll perform like the other TKIO combos. Whether or not they'll have a survival advantage it remains to be seen. And, you know, I don't know that they're going to necessarily be in advance. It's hard to believe they're going to be that much better than, say, Axi Pembro, which we have. But we're waiting for that. Um, you know, and then we're kind of resetting and saying, okay, what's the next wave of phase threes here? We have this HIF molecule that's exciting, going to start to be integrated, and obviously it was bought by Merck, who has a lot of resources and drugs to, to develop it. Um, we're waiting for these adjuvant trials to read out, which I don't know will be this year, but should be in the next year or so, which could then totally change the landscape and the kind of frontline patients we see. So, you know, we're kind of in this transition period where one wave of phase threes are ending, and I think another one's about to begin. Um, and then, th speaking of levotinib, actually, can you maybe expand on some of the ways that we're best using this agent? And um, if you want to expand a little bit on the pembrolizumab and levotinib, or even looking at it in the second line setting with everolimus. Sure. So, lenvatinib has been studied in combination with pembrolizumab. We usually call it lenpembro. And um, as I mentioned, there's a big frontline phase three trial that should read out, to, and we all expect activity. It had some of the most impressive phase two activity. Um, uh, in the second line setting, it's been used with Everolimus as sort of in the refractory setting. That, that combination of Len Everolimus is also an arm of the frontline study. So it's, and I think it was done as a, a post marketing commitment after they got approval. And so it's in, it'll be interesting to see how that compares with the Len Pembro. My expectation is that Len Pembro will be better. I'm a fan of putting IO up front. That regimen certainly has utility, it also has some toxicity concerns. And so where that regimen's going to fit in, I'm not actually sure. You know, uh, I think doublets and triplets that are IO-based will dominate the front line. 
and then we'll start to sort out the salvage setting and whether immune therapy is active after immune therapy is a big question. So I think it's, um, you know, the role of lenvatinib and, and those combinations is sort of evolving. You know, lenevirolimus in the refractory setting, lenpembro in the frontline setting, but we're waiting for some of these big data sets to sort out. And then just one more side note, there was some data presented at ESMO about lenpembro in patients who were refractory to PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitors. Hmm. Um, and I don't remember all the details, smallish single arm study, but the response rate was something like 60%. Oh. So again, a question for the field is, is, is IO active after IO? And this would suggest yes. Again, single arm study, small numbers, all the caveats, but it's, it's an area where I think you'll see a lot of drug development in the future in trials. Thank you. Sure. Now, I also want to turn over to your Amigos, the Twitter group that you're very sure. involved in. <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit about what you really want to accomplish with that group? Who's involved and what do you hope the um, oncology community can take away from yeah, it? Yeah, thanks for asking. So, so your Amigos, so this started um, probably 18 months ago. Um, uh, Tom Powell's and Chris Sweeney and I decided that uh, we wanted a presence on Twitter because there were a lot of people on Twitter and we thought it was important, but we wanted it to be an educational scientific presence, not um, look who I ran in at the airport, I'm going to post a picture presence, which is a lot of Twitter. Um, and so we started the group and started to tweet and then, and then have expanded it. Um, Dave McDermott, um, who I mentioned, is also part of it. And then um, Silke Gillison, who's a prostate cancer expert in Switzerland, Kala Sridhar, who's at Princess Margaret in Toronto, Laurent Salbige, who's at uh, IGR uh, in France, and Christina Ra Suarez Rodriguez, who's in, in um, uh, Barcelona at Val de Bron. So it's a, a very diverse geographic, you know, uh, gender diverse, everything diverse group. And we started to branch out. We've actually started doing some podcasts recently. So over the last week or so, we've, we've done a bunch of podcasts. Tom and I just did one downstairs around the renal posters. Cool. Yeah, we're all a little bit technically challenged, so we need some help figuring things out, um, but we're getting there and it's just fun. You know, it's a fun thing to do, um, but we think there's a need for it. There's surprisingly uh, little of that, you know, in terms of sort of education. We've gotten a lot of good feedback, people like it. And so I think we'll, we'll go out, uh, continue with the podcast, you know, we're open to ideas. If people have ideas, um, I think we'll probably start doing some um, like Twitter online tumor boards. You know, there's some other non-oncology fields that do that. You know, bring in some patient advocate groups. It's a great way to get them involved in sort of the, the CME discussion. So it's been a fun thing and it's it's kind of taking off. So we'll see where it goes. You've been doing a lot of tweeting as well during the meeting and yeah, polls. And a little bit. Yeah, none of, you know, one of the reasons we all banded together is that individually we knew we couldn't do enough. I think to be relevant on Twitter, you have to do it three or four or five or 10 times a day and it, it just wasn't happening. Mm -hmm. So I would say we go in waves. <laughs> I did, during the session this morning, we did a bunch and then it'll be quiet and so you know, none of us are really like sort of super users or whatever the right term is, influencers. And so um, we need to do a better job at that. And I'm hoping the podcasts and the Twitter tumor boards and stuff, you know, are a way to expand our presence besides just, you know, brute force tweeting, which is kind of what Twitter is, right? You have to brute force tweet in order to be relevant. Um, so we're trying to at least do different things. We'll see how it goes. Very multi-pronged approach. Yeah, 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 hopefully so. And people can follow you at? At your amigos. Yep, is our Twitter handle. So we're up to actually 1,300 followers as of this week. So congratulations, thank that's you. great. Well, aiming for eh, maybe 2,000 by ESMO or something. We're trying to set goals for ourselves. But that's good. Yeah. It's doable, definitely. Yeah. All right. Well, great. Thank you okay. so much for coming, Dr. Rini. Sure. We really appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Gina. Thanks.